Well, thank you for joining us. You're in um, breakout session room A, just in case you need to check. And um, today, I, I wanted to thank you for investing your time in the event, and obviously the sponsors, um, this time for gathering us. It's been a huge turnout, and we're excited about that. I'm Inga Plouts. I'm an executive with Old National Bank, uh, and excited to be hosting this conversation today. I will sit down shortly, don't worry. Um, so, I'm going to let the moderators introduce themselves, or the panelists introduce themselves. I think they can do a, a better job than that. But our theme today is Reflections from the Rearview Mirror. Deals done and the journeys behind them. We've got some, some examples of buy side, sell side, and a merger. So um, let's get started. Brian, why don't you give us an introduction and then we'll, we'll go down the line and, and off we go. Absolutely. Hi guys, I'm Brian Adam. I'm the president and owner of Olympus Group. Olympus Group is a large format printer and sewer. So we make giant banners for events, trade shows, sports teams, and amusement parks. So if you have Pfizer, we print the graphics that hang from the ceiling and are around the arenas, AmFam Field, at trade shows, we print the big overhead rings and backdrops you see at trade shows and events. Uh, we're headquartered here in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. So we have production facilities in Orlando, Denver, and uh, Las Vegas. And I will share a little bit about our story. We've done some greenfielding. Uh, we did three acquisitions that were uh, tuck-in acquisitions earlier in our career, and then did one very crazy large acquisition with a uh, larger-than-life individual that I think invented the arm and sleeves and neck tattoos and really cool guy out in Las Vegas, but uh, that uh, has been a, a little bit of a, a mess integrating. And actually, coincidentally, my good friend Brian Holzhauer is here, and we acquired his family's business back in 2009. Uh, hi everybody, uh, Terry Rowinski, so I'm uh, presently the President and Chief Operating Officer at a company by the name of uh, Integrated Merchandising Solutions, uh, which is a uh, national North American organization that really is helping you brand activation uh, at a uh, point of purchase, point of consumption. So some of the folks that we just spoke with uh, or that you heard speak in the last uh, panels you know, are customers of mine, and uh, my experience that we're going to bring for you today is really uh, during the past 15 years of my career, I've been involved really on both the buy side and the sell side. Uh, I worked for a, a small company that we turned into a, a few hundred million dollar organization by the name of Buy Seasons here in New Berlin, Wisconsin a number of years back. And we uh, did five tuck-in acquisitions while I was there, which had all types of flavors and sizes and fun. Uh, and then uh, I went to uh, get out of selling costumes and decor and things to, to get into healthcare and uh, help the founder that became a friend of mine during life, uh, effectively help him and his 40 individual friends and family investors have their first exit in 2018, uh, and then an unexpected second exit uh, that happened, uh, which also exited myself over time, and we can talk about that uh, in 2021. Uh, so uh, looking forward to engaging with you, and ask questions as always, please. And I'm uh, Joe Gibson. I spent uh, 12 years as CFO for Zywave in town. It's a uh, software company for insurance brokers. So we do software for uh, property and casualty broker, benefit brokers. And uh, we, uh, over that 12 year period, we um, did 13 acquisitions, uh, tuck in add-ons, you know, basically ranging in size from a million dollars in revenue up to 30 million plus. So uh, a broad range of sizes of deals that we did. And then prior to that, I was at Pfizer, and I spent 11 years at Pfizer. Uh, I was CFO of their insurance uh, technology group, and there we did, uh, I was personally responsible for um, uh, six deals uh, in the insurance technology group. So, um, you know, good experience in the M&A world. We actually sold Zywave twice as well, so a couple of exits that we did as well, so both buy side, sell side experience. So needless to say, I think these guys have seen something of everything. Uh, I do welcome questions throughout the conversation. This is your time to, to ask questions and to dig in as well. So we don't want to be overly formal. Um, but Brian, you have alluded to this, that your, your organization and your journey has taken a number of different paths and whatnot, from tuck-in acquisitions to greenfields. Could you just share a little bit deeper more about that journey? 
And so I probably left out the coolest part of our business is Olympus is the largest producer of mascot costumes in the US. So we actually make the racing sausages, we make Bucky Badger, we make all the Ronald McDonald outfits across the world. It's kind of a fun little niche. You Bucky Badger? I, I was Bucky Badger in my head. It was a really good video on YouTube if you put in Bucky Badger, it's owned. It's me getting beat up by a Michigan State cheerleader. That's my Bucky <laughs> But uh, we didn't do any acquisitions, so it's probably irrelevant for an MA panel on the mascot side of our business. Uh, our journey, we were a flag manufacturer for the first 100 years of our existence. We made U.S. flags that were sold through large mass merchants. Uh, love the product line, super patriotic. Um, has to be domestic to manufacture, which kind of gave us, a, allowed us to compete in that space. But we really wanted to grow in this custom print space. So in between 2009 and 2011, we did three acquisitions to help us grow in this large format custom print space. Uh, they were more tuck-in acquisitions, including wholesale graphics. They helped us get into the trade show, sports, and event space and helped us expand. Uh, as lead times compressed in our industry, there was really a value to being local. The brewers aren't going to buy their graphics for their stadium from a printer outside of Milwaukee. You have to, they trade a player, you're showing up and you're taking down the Josh Hader graphics that day and putting up some new graphics you know, that evening. If the Bucks make the playoffs, they want the graphics installed overnight. Um, so you really need to be local. So then our mantra about 2011, 2012 is we wanted to expand geographically to add value to our customers. So we uh, greenfielded a couple of locations, um, which was an interesting experience for us. Obviously, with greenfielding, there's a whole lot of work. There's a ramp up to, uh, to get the revenue to certain levels, but you have 100% control, which is, which is also, if you have the runway and the bandwidth to set it up, it's a nice, uh, uh, nice way to do it because of the, the control. Uh, the tuck-in acquisitions we did were all um, between you know, one to three million dollars. They allowed us to get into space because they were tuck-ins. Again, it was they were joining part of the uh, Olympus team. Uh, in 2000, a year ago, we acquired a large organization in Las Vegas. Uh, the, we want to get to Vegas badly for the last 10 years. Vegas is the largest trade show market in the United States by a factor of probably three to four X. Tons of events, sports are growing there. There are just lots of opportunities for the type of printing we do in Las Vegas, but there was lots of competition out there. So we were a little scared to open a facility on our own, knowing that it's a little bit of red ocean, and we were just going to show up and in our minds be a me too. So we really wanted to acquire somebody out there. We, over the last 10 years, probably multiple failed acquisitions, some that got to the 11th hour and didn't happen. Then we found one that we thought was a perfect fit. They, produced graphics that go on the size of the casino, was they did work for the Raiders, they did zero trade show work, which is really our bread and butter. So it allowed us to get into Las Vegas and uh, helped for us open some doors into some markets uh, um, that we weren't in. So we got really excited about this acquisition and we, I don't know if you want me to share all the details right now, but we learned uh, uh, quite a bit uh, about um, the, I, I think my CFO, who almost quit probably a dozen times in the last year, has told me that he's going to write a case study on, on this specific acquisition and the learnings because it's been a, it's, it's been a gigantic mess. Well, I think since we're on your story, we'll give you a little moment to rest um, because I do want to come back to the CFO's case study. Um, you know, kind of what due diligence, right? You can do all the due diligence, but some of the stuff you just can't. Due diligence for. Um, so we'll definitely revert back to that. But Terry, um, you spoke about venture back, private equity. Um, can you share a little bit uh, into your insights with your experience, what it truly means to understand a deal that you're doing? Yeah, I think uh, you, you heard it, you heard the drum beat multiple times in, in the past sessions where we're talking about people. Uh, you know, people are unfortunately at the center of this and Love it. People are at the center of this as well in terms of what's happening, and and the way either as I was selling an asset such as HPS, you know, which was my last go around, or prior to that when I was at Buy Seasons, we were buying, you know, organizations. We weren't just buying a company. We weren't just buying an asset. We were buying the people, the management team, the investment stakeholders, prior owners, you know, folks of the like that were coming along as part of this transaction. And as I really look at it, you kind of put it into like three or four concentric circles. You know, first and foremost is, is you being the person in the chair that is either selling your organization or you're going to go hopefully purchase another. 
um, you, you need to anchor yourself as an individual in that process and have some folks in your own inner circle that can act as your own advisor, friends, family, other people in terms of what's happening because you need a little bit of an independent lens to land on. Confidentiality, incredibly you know, needed. You don't have to share every little dirty detail with your friends or your family, but you need somebody that you can trust that you can just land on and have kind of that safe conversation for you as a person in terms of what's going on. In terms of your organization, uh, you heard it you know, from the last conversation, you, know, you don't want to just go broad. Oh, we're out to go get sold. You do that to your management team or to folks the next level down. The amount of distraction that's going to take place while you're trying to run your business successfully because you still have to deliver results to be purchased later in life it is, is incredible. And the amount of, of ultimate, you know, uh, for lack of a better, making people tired, that's one way to do it is effectively spread your message too broad internally before you're ready to do what you're ready to do. You do need your specialty folks kind of in your third circle, legal, HR consultants. Uh, it, for my company, HPS, we were dealing with two really incredible data sets, personal health information and payment and credit information about people. You know, we had the fear of, uh, of God, small g, from compliance built into our organization and it paid dividends, but we also needed those folks alongside us when we were trying to sell the organization, and we had to be very, very buttoned up. And then really last, whether you are buying or selling, you need another circle and you need that key person in that organization that you're dealing with. You know, for me in the last time when, when we sold HPS in 2021, I needed to know in the equity firm that was going to write a huge check for what had happened prior at a multiple that was great for the people that had bought us in 2018. I needed to know that that person and I and my team was really going to connect and that was going to be my person to carry this deal through through thick and thin because with everything else I just shared, all the stuff that we were holding in terms of data, compliance, everything else, something was going to hit the, hit the proverbial pothole deal or deal pothole, depending how you want to look at it. And you just need that person on the other side that you can pick up the phone to and actually have a real conversation with to make your way through in the end. And that's really on both the venture and the private equity side. So you spoke about a couple of deals and, and readiness. Readiness and having your teams, um, you know, expectations, timing. What, what advice do you have with regards to that, just kind of the you know, knowing what you're getting into, being ready for it, and then what you've learned. Yeah, I mean, really, uh, getting into it, um, at HPS, you know, I was the only individual in our firm that had ever bought and sold a company. Uh, so for my CFO, for my head of sales, other people that were along, even people much senior to me from industry experience doing other things fascinating and wonderful in life, they've just never been involved in a transaction. So as I was able to bring some people under the proverbial tent, effectively helping them understand somewhat the do's and don'ts of how you effectively just be your authentic self, because that's what people wish to buy and engage with, but don't be overly authentic and know when to stop talking. <laughs> How's that first statement? Um, and then second, you know, don't volunteer what doesn't need to be spoken about in terms of the things that you're really working through. You're going to be, if you're, if you're effectively buying another organization, you're gonna be putting somebody through a discovery process. If you're gonna be selling your organization, you're gonna be put through the discovery process. Many things will come out in that process that you end up needing to just give people guidance on. And also making sure that people understand just because something didn't go well, or a call was uh, thought to have not gone well. I sold HBS the last time over Zoom. I never saw our buyers until uh, you know, six months later, they were much shorter than I thought they were. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, it's ultimately just being able to have people be able to breathe through it. And, you know, we feel, you know, us that we're the owners, we're the people that were invested through our own private, our own personal equity, as well as people that invested us prior. You know, we feel that commitment that we need to get it done. But you need to just breathe through it and let the things naturally fall through as they do and into place and, and go forward. Thank you. <clears throat> well, Joe, off to 13 acquisitions. Can you share a little bit about your approach to scaling through acquisition? Uh, we were first and foremost uh, organic growth. We focused on organic growth. That was like a number one for us. But then when we thought about it, we said, let's go down the, the avenue of using M&A as an engine to grow it organically. And the way to think about that is the uh, add-on acquisitions were really around the standpoint of complementary products that could uh, plug and play into our products and be integrated into our, our product set. Um, 
we did do some overlapping acquisitions, which were pure competitors to us that we could basically take their products and uh, sunset those and move the customers over to our existing uh, products that we had. But at the end of the day, the complementary ones were the ones that increased our total addressable market and uh, basically gave us white space to sell into. So our customers were um, the same in the acquired companies as well as our existing uh, company that we had. So that was the, that was the uh, A number one strategy that we used. In the early days, it was um, you know, myself and the CEO going out and developing relationships with, um, with potential targets, developing a list, and then eventually we said, we really want to amp things up. So we really want to take it to the next level, create some velocity here. How do we do that? Well, you need to get it off of the operators the 100% of the sourcing out off of the off operator's uh, desk because I was doing it on the side of my desk trying to close these deals or trying to actually source the deals. And so we did uh, create a, a corporate development department about five years ago and that really did increase the velocity. I mean, I can't tell you having somebody dedicated that came out of private equity, dedicated to developing relationships with founders and companies that were being run uh, uh, you know, by hired guns, um, it was a, a night and day. And then developing the relationship with the bankers that were going to bring us the deals. That was fantastic to have somebody that was in there just dedicated to do it. Um, and that probably took us up, I don't know, three or four times the velocity that we had before, which was great. Um, and then eventually we built out that team as well. We added an analyst that did modeling and did market data and other analysis that was required. Our pitch decks for our board, it was very useful. And then uh, basically they were able to take it all the way to the close and get the deals, get the deals done um, uh, over time. Great. I want to stick with you for a moment. So you were able to formalize your process a, a bit with additional team members. But I'm thinking, I'm still stuck on 13 acquisitions. So that means 13 founders and you know 13 new integrations can, can you talk about a little bit about the human elements and when is it maybe too early too late to start thinking integration yeah so i'll start with uh the employees um we are are very much focused on transparency so we want to make sure that every employee at the target as well as the uh, as our company post close understand why we bought the company and so they understand what our strategy is, how the, how the uh, companies fit together, how we want to grow organically uh, going forward, from that point forward, and how we're going to do it as a team. And we're bringing them uh, under, under the tent, basically on day one through a, uh, a town hall that'll give them all the information that gives them the, that strategy that, that's occurring. We're immediately putting them on our payroll and benefits and making them part of the family. And then the one thing is that um, does need to get figured out is the integration aspect of it. And um, certainly with the founder, since they're the person that's actually selling the company, uh, we'll have that conversation ahead of time to understand how they're gonna fit into the uh, aspects of the company going forward. Um, not everybody's like Truman. You know, they don't, they don't all wanna stick around. And so some of them are, are uh, serial entrepreneurs, they will help with transition, and then they're going to move on and do something else, and that's fine. That's fantastic, you know. And we can do knowledge transfer. They want a good home for their business that they have built, but they may not necessarily be one to not be there anymore after they're not calling the shots because they've run the sh they've run the show for how many years building the business. And so um, I think we have one situation where we actually did have a founder that became uh, an executive at our company. And it's been a great, great um, situation. He's now been with us for you know, five, five years and been a fantastic addition, big knowledge, um, you know, huge amount of knowledge that he's brought to us and uh, a, a very intelligent guys. But it doesn't always work out that way where the founders can stay in the business. No, 
that's helpful. I think it's important to understand why, what your role is and whether it's going to be the right situation for that founder to, to be successful in, in the new environment. Um, so, Brian, CFO case study, tell us more about what you, where you landed and what you didn't know you were getting into. We wanted to get into Vegas so bad because the opportunities for us in this market is just huge. So we're like, all right, we, we have to get into Las Vegas. We've probably said that for five to ten years. Here's an opportunity to do it. I mean, their customer list, MGM, Caesars, Raiders, those are key customers for us. Seems like a great fit. They admitted, the, the, the owner got bad advice. He had an awful advisor, and that was probably his downfall. He did not have great business acumen. He'd never gone through MA before. Didn't have a business degree. Just really good salesperson. But you know, when we, we probably were naive when we did the acquisition, we didn't do enough due diligence around the nuances of this business. We're like, hey, our accounting is buttoned up, our pricing is buttoned up, our systems are buttoned up. We'll just, you're bad at that. That's okay. We're, we're good at that. We'll come in and we'll just, we'll fix it all up. We'll, then when we got there and actually uncovered how bad they were, when we talked to their accounting team, we're like, well, do you, do you reconcile you know, your, your invoices against your PLs? I think the comment was, what's a PL? Like, do, do you, did, when we actually dug into it, we didn't ask that sales, so we were protected, but I mean, they owed hundreds of thousands of dollars and had no idea who they owed it to. And they were owed hundreds of thousands of dollars from their key customers for the last couple of years and had no idea who owed them what. So here we were thinking, we'll just, we'll come in, we'll put our culture in there, we got that buttoned up, we'll grow our business, we'll grow these sales. And, um, well, that, that, we, I think after four months, our executive team actually had to take a step back and we said, we have to start from ground zero. Like, we have to say, like, okay, now when we enter an order, I need a customer name for every order. Do I need a price, I need a cost. I need to know who the bill to is, I need to ship to, I need the due date. Like those are like you can't enter an order without these five things. We really had to start building stuff from scratch. And uh, for my CFO, what it meant was like, invoice by invoice, he had to go through you know, line items for every single bill they had, for every single amount they were owed. And you know, normal networking capital adjustments are done in 120 days. Um, we fit ours is not complete yet. And we closed January 1st of last year. So it's 14 months later. And it's because you'll still get notifications that, hey, this tax has never been paid. This hasn't been paid. So it's also been a gigantic swing, which is going to be tough for the old owner to understand that, hey, this is right. What I thought I was getting, I actually owe this. Um, so I think our learnings from it, we should have done a quality earnings review. We should have, we thought, like, no problem. We'll come in there, we'll button this stuff up. But there was so many more skeletons in the closet than we had thought. Um, that it, we could have protected ourselves more. And then the, the real challenge was I just burned out my executive team. It was just so much work for all of them that by the, you know, by the end of last summer, they were just, they were tapped. I mean, their desire to keep pushing was just, you know, I couldn't put anything else on the player. They would have left because they're just, uh, it was just such a monumental task to try to uh, basically take an organization that was just being run by the seat of somebody's pants with no structure and process and put in you know, business one-on-one. Wow. <laughs> uh, you know, the opportunity to move into a market to, to, you know, acquire a good team to, you know, timing isn't always on your side, right? And so being able to, to do that and still stand up and move forward, um, that, that's an incredible feat. Um, Terry, talking about unforeseen things out of left field, um, like success being Maybe you're on the team, maybe you're not on the team, and working yourself out of a position. Talk a little bit about that that ex that journey. Yeah, Joe, Joe, had, Joe had mentioned you know uh, bringing folks in from you know one person out of thirteen made, made it into their executive team. Um, this is more really on, on the buy side, you know. So when when we were at buy seasons and we were we had a great process that was run by our venture firm and they had you know tons of folks that would help us get the deal done. But it was up to us to, to ascertain and, and assess the value of the folks that were in the organization. They weren't going to do that for us because we were the ones that had to work together. And uh, it was actually my first transaction there, so I was a little bit new and went behind the ears in terms of this. But you just get a feeling in terms of folks that you know that you want to be part of your family from that from that acquisition that, that you're getting into. And uh, after the, the deal closed, you know, it, you go along and you, know, you have celebrations, you have the parties, you have all the communication. Uh, you make the trip around the facilities around the U.S. because you want to welcome each individual, you know, camp into, into yours in terms of what's going on. 
And then you start to see the things that start to break at the seams. You start to see the people that are reporting to people saying, you know what, this person does or doesn't do this, or you know, they're really not the way that you guys describe your culture in terms of what's happening. So you almost see a little bit of the inside fighting that you really don't get a view towards as you're doing an acquisition of an asset. And, uh, and ultimately that ends in terms of one of two ways. Either you have to make a decision you know, with the leader. Do you make a choice to, to help that leader you know, effectively get his or her hands around their, their family that they've been a part of prior to joining yours? Uh, or do you exit them? And, and one day, uh, you know, as I just had that understanding that somebody wasn't exactly where they were, uh, you know, I went to our management team and said, we have to make a change. Uh, literally jumped on a plane that night, ended up in Greensboro, North Carolina, you know, at five o'clock in the morning so I could meet the individual as he showed up at six in the morning. And as he saw me, he started crying. And uh, I thought, oh gosh, you know, this poor guy, I'm gonna fire this gentleman and, and he is really not happy about it. And then I was like, wow, it's just me and him at the facility. This isn't maybe good for me either. Because uh, he actually outsized me and I'm a pretty big, big guy. Um, he actually came and gave me a hug. He said, Thank goodness, somebody actually saw how miserable I was here and what was going on you know, during this process. And uh, and thank you so much. Uh, can I leave today? <laughs> um, you know, so uh, occasionally, you know, even the best diligence process, you know, can run a little bit awry in terms of not getting everything 100% correct. And that's your team's job in terms of really having your ear to the ground and understanding what's going on and whatever you just ended up doing, buy or sell side so that you can adjust and effectively adapt and go forward. Um, and you have to be nimble. I mean, you, you just, your team just showed it in spades in terms of everything you did out in Vegas. Maybe what happened in Vegas should have stayed in Vegas. But, <laughs> uh, but, uh, but you know, it's, 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 you're dealing with people's lives and livelihoods, and unfortunately at times uh, people aren't actually what they're represented to be as a part of the transaction. Yeah, I think in, in reflection, there's something to be said about theory and the playbook and how things should go, but there's much more to be said about having the experience and having done deals and having those elements of your team around the table supporting and consulting and, and helping you move through. I'd love to open it up for questions. Sure, Andy. I'm curious, uh, from the uh, previous session, the quality of the management team is one of the key things. There's gotta be at least an unconscious, if not an overt, attempt to dress up a little bit uh, how good the management team is, which can lead to, Terry, what you were talking about, the, the surprises you get on the people side after, after diligence. Any thoughts on sort of how to suss that out during diligence, not to, you know, what, what's in bounds, what's out of bounds in terms of checking people, references, LinkedIn, exposes people to... Check. I just want to make sure everybody heard the question. Yeah. We're good? Okay, so... How to ascertain the quality, the true quality of that? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, one of the key jobs of the banker is to make sure you have limited access to people during the process. So um, it is it is on the buy side, you know, responsibility to be asking for those type of meetings, to be asking for exposure to, you know, the person that needs sales, the person that needs, you know, development. Um, manufacturing, if you're in the manufacturing industry, going a level below the CEO because many times the CEO is that face and they're doing all the talking in the meetings. For me, that's like a major red flag. If they're doing all the talking, I, I just have a feeling that there's something that's not being said or that only the script that's being written is being said. So always want to see kind of that next level a deep dive into the functional areas and it goes back i realized i didn't answer your full question around integration but that is a key thing that we do in diligence is make sure that we have a deep dive into each functional area and we understand the, how the executives run that area where the gaps or exceptions are between our playbook and the way that we run our go-to-market organization or our gma function or our product development organization organization. But then we're assessing and able to assess those leaders of those functional areas. And without that, I don't know how you suss it out because you're just relying on the one person who's the face of the organization. Yeah, I 110% agree. You know, as part of the, uh, the management presentation, you know, that's the, the technical term for it, right? <laughs> uh, or whatever, you know, we call it the 
the ultimate uh, you know, faces of the organization are the folks that you want to be able to get your access to. And uh, you know, as, as either on the sell side, I also asked the same exact thing on the buy side in terms of what was happening. So when I sold health payment systems a second time, uh, you know, we sold to a strategic health equity organization that was very sophisticated in terms of what they were doing. But I wanted to understand and meet folks that were a level down in their organization as well that would actually be dealing with us. Who is going to be actually working with my finance team when we did our reporting and our close? Who is going to be working with my HR and legal team, if which was two people? But for them, you know, and, and for me as well, I wanted to see what was reciprocated on the other side. And for us, we actually had the opportunity to sell in a good market. We had the opportunity to sell because we weren't being forced to. We had the opportunity where our existing holders were only two years into their investment on their horizon and they wanted the best price possible, but they also wanted to stay in the asset from an ownership perspective, so they wanted to make sure it was a good fit. And we were blessed to have them support us, actually asking a lot of really intriguing questions of the people that were acquiring us. That would be a little bit maybe out of bounds for somebody that's selling out of a desperation event or something. Yeah, I appreciate that. I'm sure many of you get the opportunity to walk through manufacturing plants and visit with your clients, and it's very easy to see when you're on the plant floor who truly understands the business, who's in the business, who knows their colleagues' names, ask about their kids. And so it's very telling when you're when you're walking through an organization. We have five minutes left, so um, any additional questions, and then we'll wrap it up with some, some pieces of advice. Don't be shy. Uh, sure, go ahead. You, you mentioned the playbook, and not overly relying on that, but how many of you actually have um, yeah, with the number of acquisitions we were doing, we certainly had a, a um, good checklist of items that had to be done. And this is how we standardize doing them. Uh, like I said, during diligence and then the meetings after closing, you're doing deeper dive to understand where the exceptions are. And by exceptions, I mean you acquire a company that has a customized system that they homegrown made that does all their back office operations. Well, hopefully you know that going into closing, that you've got it. But you're going to need a pretty customized way of integrating that into your way of doing business. And so knowing that up front is extremely important. Like you need to be able to take that into account. Um, and so those are all, that's, that's like A number one, um, in my opinion, Terry. Yeah, I mean, the, the experience, uh, you know, at Buy Seasons, we did five of those acquisitions. Uh, I think we ended up getting a playbook done at about three and a half uh, in terms of something that was actually road ready and, and ready to go for the next couple that we had done there. Um, I'm at an organization right now that we are at a crescendo moment where we can go and take the next really big ladder step for the company. And, you know, the management team there, because of my experience, said, what should we do? And I said, exactly that. Let's start to create exactly how we want to bring somebody into our culture and how we want to bring, you know, the things that the investments or the investment advisors are always going to be the T's and I's about the legal, all the, all the other types of things that need to happen to make sure that nobody gets sued as a result of doing it. They're not helping you make sure that you can actually run the thing when you're together. And that's what's up to you to work with the new team that you're getting involved with to actually have that power of one plus one equaling three or five or whatever the number ends up being over time. And, uh, and I wouldn't say it needs to be a full playbook, but you should have some things pretty well scripted and ready to rock and roll. Yeah, it's pretty much like a best practice uh, checklist type thing with definitely all of the activities that need to take place post acquisition. And you should have a general idea as to how long it takes to do each one of them. So if you're going to convert everybody to the payroll system, you've got to know how many pay cycles it's going to take to do that. And that's just part of the uh, general playbook that each functional area should have. We're not sophisticated in French. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't really have a playbook. We had a checklist, and I was probably on Google Googling, like, all right, what's, uh, what's, the, what's the integration plan? So I can put something together. But uh, so we had a plan. Some of it didn't work, obviously. But uh, our industry uh, might be a little different. Uh, no playbook, though.
much stuff to do. Well, I, I think it's fair to say that not every company is as acquisitive. You know, this is an event that happens once or twice, maybe thrice, along the entire journey of the organization. So leaning on, on good partners and friends and Google uh, <laughs> sometimes <laughs> is the way to call it. Chat GPT. Yeah. Um, well, I want to be respectful of your time. We are at the 5 o'clock hour, so we're going to wrap up with one piece of advice from each of our panelists on when you're looking at opportunities, what piece of advice would you give? Brian, I'm going to start with you. Yeah, I mean, I think it's what people talked about, get to know the people as, 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 as deeply and as intimately as you can. I mean, we probably didn't dig, we certainly did not dig deep enough. I had a personal relationship with the owner, and didn't push beyond the uh, personal relationship I developed networking at, at events and should have pushed a lot harder to take a lot deeper to understand probably the, the true ethos of the individual. Um, as you put your oxygen mask on first, because you will need it during either side of a process that you're going to be in, um, the second question while you're breathing is to basically just say, can I envision myself actually working here? If you're acquiring something or you are selling and you have new owners buying you or you are acquiring something else, can you actually picture yourself as an individual being in that other organization as a part of what's taking place? If you can't, that is called your gut reaction. That might be your throw-up moment, so take the oxygen mask off. Um, but ultimately, you need to be able to place yourself in that situation very personally because it does get very personal after it closes. If the financial transaction is done, it's off to the races to actually make it now worthwhile. So can you be, actually be a part of that team as you go forward? Um, I think the environment, well, I know the environment has obviously changed uh, over the last couple of years here. and. Um, the scrutiny on the deals on the buy side is much higher. If you have an investor uh, in your business today, they're probably going to be looking at the deals a lot closer and want you to be looking at the deals a lot closer. Lenders are going to do the same thing. They're going to want to make sure that the diligence is being done and it's not just checks about check the box anymore. It's going to be a lot more detailed and a lot more scrutiny on it. So that just amps up the uh, uh, pressure on doing good diligence ahead of a deal. Um, you know, it, it, it's no big deal, it's just now it might take a little bit more time to do a deal because now you have more um, hoops to jump through. I would, I would have to say also that we always like to talk about the deal, the event, you know, whether it was the, side, the sell side or the buy side, <clears throat> the real value is in successful integration. You know, really activating both companies or the surviving company to harness the benefit of the value that was acquired. Um, please help me in thanking our panelists for joining us today.